Sarasishi Mar, His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Goswami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, John Vishnu Pad, Paramang Savirvaka Jara, Sarasishi Mar, His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai, Sri Guru Parampara Ki Jai, Sri Mad Gitu Panishad Ki Jai, Vrindavan Dhamma Ki Jai, Damodar Kartik Vrat Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Shri Shri Guru and Goranga. Go Premananda Hari Hari Bo. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. All together, please. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Ganandana Salakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Stavidam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yukta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sadvadutam Prijana Satan Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padang Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gobika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapcha Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Prishavana Sudha Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpat Rubyas Chakri Pasindu Bevacha Padinanam Pavnebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Srivasadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So, reading from Srimad Gita Upanishad, translation and commentary, His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, today's chapter, The Perfection of Renunciation. And today's verse is number 14. 18th chapter. Please repeat. Adishthanam Tata Karta Karanam Cha Pritagvidam Vividas Cha Pritak Sesta Devim Chaivatra Panchamam Adhisthanam Tathakarta Karanam Cha Pritagvidam Vividas Cha Pritagchesta Devim Chai Vatra Panchamam Adhisthanam Tathakarta Karanam cha pritag vidham Vividas cha pritag chesta Devam cha vatra panchamam Adhisthanam tata karta Karanam cha pritag vidham Vidas cha pritag chesta Devim Chai Vatra Panchanam Mam Adhisthanam Tata Karta Adhisthanam Tata Karta Karanam Chai Prathak Vidham Prathak Vidham Vividascha Prathak Cheshta Vividascha Prathak Cheshta Devam Chai Vatra Panchamam Devam Chai Prathak Panchamam Adhisthanam Tathakarta Adhisthanam Tathakarta 
शरण क्या भरभद्रम Okay, word for word, Adhisthanam, the place, Tata, also, Karta, the worker, Karanam, instruments, Cha, and Pritagvidam, of different kinds, Vividha, various, Cha, and Pritak, separate, Chaitasaha, the endeavors, Devam, the supreme, Cha, also, Eva, certainly, Atra, here, Panchamam, the fifth. Translation, Srila Prabhupada. The place of action, the body, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul, these are the five factors of action. Please repeat. The place of action, the body, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. These are the five factors of action. Yeah, so this is good information here. Oh, Makam Karochi Vachalam Pangam Laite Grim Yat Kripa Tamam Bande Dirinam. So the place of action, the body, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul, these are the five factors of action. So good information here. Of course, now in the modern world, the atheistic demoniac class have, are capturing all the educational institutions all over the world. So nobody knows they're not the body. Huh? Here we are, the place of action, the body. So people think, I am the body, and that's it. <laughs> I perform actions. Right? That's it, more or less. They have that philosophy. There was a big bang out of nothing. That created everything. Then everything that was created out of nothing became conscious, somehow or other. Then it started to evolve into different categories of life. Then, and fourth, there's no point to it. <laughs> That's their basic substrata, which is being t taught in the world. But here we have in Bhagavad Gita a different view of reality. Uh, everything is resting, ultimately, the super soul, everything is resting upon the Supreme Lord. Huh? And we are not the body, but we are the performer. The place of action, the body, the performer, that's the soul. Prabhupada explained that. Oh, did I read the purport? No. Oh, that's I just realized. Sorry, I was thinking. So I'll read the purport now. The word adhisthanam refers to the body. The soul within the body is acting to bring about the results of activity and is therefore known as karta, the doer. The soul is the knower and the doer is stated in the Shruti, Esha hi drashta shrashtram, Prashna Upanishad 4.9. It is also confirmed in the Vedanta Sutra by the verses Gyokta Eva 2.3.18 and Karta Shastra Thavartat 2.3.33. The instruments of action are the senses and by the senses the soul acts in various ways. For each and every action there is a different endeavor. But all one's activities depend on the will of the super soul who is situ situated within the heart as a friend. The Supreme Lord is the super cause. Under these circumstances, who, he who is acting in Krishna consciousness under the direction of the super soul situated within the heart is naturally not bound by any activity. 
will say that again. That's a very interesting. Under these circumstances, he who is acting in Krishna consciousness rather than material consciousness, under the direction of the super soul situated within the heart, is naturally not bound by any activity. Karma, lokayam karma bandhana. If you act separate, your endeavor is selfish, then you become bound by karma. Those in complete Krishna consciousness are not ultimately responsible for their actions. Very interesting. Those in complete, Prabhupada says, complete Krishna consciousness. That means they are completely liberated from material duality, material motivation, desire for the results of activities in a selfish manner completely purified are not ultimately responsible for their actions because they perform no material actions everything is dependent on the supreme the super soul the personality of godhead so that's a nice uh, summary sentence at the end everything is dependent on the supreme will the super soul the personality of godhead yes so like i said uh, this concept of everything depending upon the all-pervading Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, this is not being taught. People are being taught that they are independent, right? They're, they're a chance combination out of a chance explosion, a chance body, with, uh, and uh, you're all going to die. There's no point to it at all. But here, uh, this stupid philosophy which is taught so widely by the demoniac, that becomes the platform for performing so many bad activities. I've got one life, so let me live it full, even if I transgress moral law or my duties or my obligations to society, friendship, family, relatives. Oh, the main thing is that I should enjoy. This kind of philosophy is naturally born out of atheism, right? Because, oh, I'm going to die, so I may as well, as they say, uh, the um, American expression, he who gets the most toys wins. You know, if I have the most houses and the most sports cars and the most money in the bank when I die, I'm the winner. But you're the winner of what? <laughs> you're going to lose everything. <laughs> So people don't understand that this material world is just a monopoly game. You're playing the game and you're very intensely absorbed in the monopoly game. But when the game comes to an end, all the, all the money and all the pieces go back in the box and you have nothing. Only your illusory memories. So this whole material world, uh, we're engaged on the material platform in complete forgetfulness of this transcendental reality just again another example like a chess game people are playing you're black I'm white we're playing and it all seems very real <gasps> he's going to take my bishop oh he's going to check no he's, I'm going to do this it all seems very your emotions are involved your pride he's not going to defeat me I'm more intelligent everything seems very important but then the game comes to an end the pieces are put back in the box and the whole thing was just pointless game, right? All you did was exercise your brain. <laughs> so this material world, everyone uh, is engaged in a very serious manner about the material energy because their forgetfulness of their real engagement with the Supreme. This is the point. You see, we want, the soul is active, Krishna is active, he's not static, he's ecstatic. So we, we're part and parcels of Krishna, so we are also active, our mind, our consciousness, we want engagement. But we're engaged in illusion, in forgetfulness of the super soul, how everything is dependent upon the Supreme Lord, how everything has not emanated from a big bang, but is emanated from the inconceivable Shakti of the Supreme Lord who has got full of variety for who's omnipotent omnipresent and he has created the living entities it's everything is emanated from him 
And we are given free will. And one of our basic choices is, do we want to take up the service of Krishna or do we want to serve ourselves? So we're Tatasta Shakti. If the marginal potency, if we decide to serve Krishna, we go to the spiritual world and we blossom. If we decide to uh, take up a rejection mentality of the Supreme Lord, we enter the material world and then we try to be the Lord. And we try to exploit the situation. But all that happens is we become bound by karma because we're acting independent of the will of the Supreme. So that is, from the material point of view, the, from the living entity's point of view, the material nature has two functions. Krishna has given it for a two functions. The living entity can live a life, independent life, separate from God consciousness, where he takes his emotions, his endeavors, his activities as the uh, supreme goal. But there's also another effect in the material energy. Because it is the material energy, the jada, the jada maya, the secondary energy, it does not give satisfaction to the Supreme Soul. So eventually the living entity realizes, what's the point of this? And the, the human body is particularly uh, the place on Bhumandala, on the earth planet, where one can contact that knowledge which can liberate oneself from this illusory endeavor. The animals, the birds, the bees, the trees, the microbes, the viruses, they cannot understand that beyond this material engagement there is a spiritual reality. Sutre, money, gna, eva. That everything is resting on the Supreme Lord. They cannot understand that. But the human beings can easily understand it, even if they don't accept it. The, the idea that there's a spiritual reality is understood even by children, right? If, you, if a child asks their parents, where does everything come from? Then the mother says, it all came from God. It was created by God. The child will go, hmm. <laughs> Most children, right, they will understand, even when they're little children. They don't say, what do you mean God? There's no God. This everything come from a big bang mummy. <laughs> no. They'll accept, yes. Just like when I was a child, my mother, well, I came from a big family, eight children, so every two, three years there was another child. So uh, after, uh, I was number two, like Krishna. I have an elder brother like Krishna. Krishna's elder brother is Balaram. Anyway, so after about four children, I was about eight or something, I said to mommy, where do babies come from? And my mother said, well, when you're married, God knows you want babies, so he sends them. So I was thinking, hmm, God is sending babies. So <laughs> but I didn't question the concept of God, but whether God was sending the babies, that was, question, that was something for contemplation. So anyway, the concept of God, and even if you listen to the atheists, a few years back they had what's called neo-atheists, new atheists. So I looked up their debates on YouTube. And one thing struck me, that the atheists, they all have the same idea of God as the theist. They all agree that God is some kind of super being with all power, who's the creator, right? They all have that same idea, but the only question is they have an attitude problem. They don't accept it. Right? They don't accept. That's all. But the concept is very easy. It's all absorbed in the human society. So that is because human. once the soul has come to the human form, then he's in an atmosphere where spiritual inquiry and spiritual realization is his birthright, is his duty. So, this knowledge in Bhagavad Gita, all this atheism, this is, and it will go and come, but Bhagavad Gita 
is the real story. Here we have it, the adhisthanam, the body. You can extend the body to the environment, the five factors of action. The body is inside an environment. So according, to, like, I'm using this body to talk inside this environment, this room. But then the performer, so this is the first point of spiritual knowledge, that the body is the vehicle for the soul. You're all experienced devotees. And we realize that as we get older, like Bibishan said, uh, why do old people come to the class? Because they realize they're not the body. <laughs> it's a different answer. But because, yes, you have more chance. As you get older, you know I'm the same person when I was asking my mother, where do babies come from? I'll tell you the rest of the story, if you don't mind. It's a funny story. So in those days, they didn't have internet. We didn't have television in our house. My father wouldn't allow it. He says it was a bad influence. So a little time later, we used to have the evening paper. And in the stop press, do you know the stop press, the last printing? It said, a girl in Brazil, 10 years old, has a baby. Because my mother said, you know, when you're married, God knows you want children, he sends them. So I said to my mother, I said, Mother, it says here, there's a baby uh, born in Brazil to a 10-year-old. And you can't be married when you're 10. So why did God send a baby there? I'm only eight or something like this. And she said, well, sometimes God makes a special case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so special case I wasn't very satisfied but I didn't have the anyway so the thing is we're not the body <laughs> this, is, this knowledge is the basis of all spiritual inquiry so if we're not the body then who are we the performer the various senses so the body the senses they come through the body just like electricity comes through the pipe from the power station so the senses, they're working, they're, they're hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling, touching, only be through the material body, just like a filter. The, body, the soul is the conscious and perceiving object, but he is seeing through the material senses in the material uh, condition. So therefore I'm seeing through my eyes, but the soul is seeing through the eyes. You understand? The soul is seeing through the body and touching. The, the soul is smelling through the body, but through the means of the material senses. Same thing with the taste and so on. So the other senses too, um, in the Vedas, they're, they're, they're called Gyan Indriyas knowledge acquiring senses but there's also calm indriyas and that should be um, brought up because we're discussing action the calm indriyas are the working senses so there are five knowledge acquiring hearing uh, touch sight uh, taste and smell but there are also five working senses and you can see a relationship of them to the five knowledge acquiring senses. For example, the highest sense is the sense of hearing, it's related to ether. So the working sense on that level is the voice. With the voice we vibrate the ether and it acts upon the air and sound is produced. So the voice. And then the next thing is the sense of touch, right? Tactile sense. So that's in the body. So the tactile, the second working sense is the arms. And just by way of remembrance, we, our arms move freely in the air, which is related to the sense of touch. Then you come down again, and the next working sense is fire, is digestion. People perform activity by speaking, by using their arms and also they digest food so that's related to the fire organ 
which is a level which is also related to sight. Sight becomes form, starts to manifest on the material gradation through fire. We don't see form in air, we don't see form in sound. Through our imagination we do, but not through our senses. So anyway, so then the next sense down is the genital, the working sense. And that is related to uh, water, because it's different fluids, different fluids combine and they create a body. And then the working sense, uh, the earth is the... Um, element that produces this related to the sense of smell and that is related to the legs because the legs stand on the earth so you have you can really remember it in that way and it's interesting to see the relationship because from uh, ether you have hearing and then you have uh, sorry from the sense of from ether you have the sense of hearing and then you have speaking and you can relate them all the way down. So it's, it sh indicates design, the way it is all related. We have five gross elements, five working senses and five knowledge acquiring senses. What? Related to the se sense of touch. Because you touch the air. When you move your hand, you're, you're feeling touch. When something it comes through the air, same thing, the eyes come through the fire. Fire comes through the eyes, the shape. Before that, there's no shape. There's no smell in fire. There's no taste in fire. The next element is water. That's where taste comes. Water, sense of taste, and then the uh, genital the fluids, so they're related. And then you have earth, sense of smell, and then the feet standing upon earth. So you can see there's an enclosed system. So these are the senses, and they're all accumulated within the body. The body is like the sum total. And above that, Krishna says, uh, the, there's also the mind is a sense. That's what the psychics are doing. Because the mind is a container of consciousness. So purified consciousness, with a trained yogi, he can look at different regions, different times, he can get intuition. So the mind, and also naturally anyway, we do that anyway. We feel this dog is dangerous, this one is peaceful. Uh, this person is in an angry mood, this person is very kind and gentle. We naturally sense with the mind. So, let's move on. The various senses, different kinds of endeavor. But of course, they all relate around two axes. We, uh, we endeavor to increase pleasure or access pleasure. And we also endeavor to stop suffering. It's as simple as that when you bump it down. We want to eat nice things, we want to see nice things, we want to smell nice scents, but we want to avoid toothache, we want to avoid trouble, you see. So we're, all, we're may, endeavoring on the basis of what suits me. And ultimately the super soul, super soul is, everything is resting upon him. In the earlier chapter we said, Upadrista, and Amanta. Upadrista means the overseer. Upadrista, he sees from above his position spiritually. And then Anumanta, he uh, sanctions your activity. You have a desire, so then he sanctions it and facilitates it. Actually, everything is Kartaha Miti Manyate. Actually, everything we're doing is facilitated by the super soul through the demigods. The super soul perceives our desire and then that desire is fulfilled through the actions of the demigods on the material platform in our body. So there are the five factors of action. So, but one point important now is, we've discussed this because this is good Upanishad, uh, 
knowledge, very good knowledge by which we can see the world. But we also want to see this chapter. It's called the perfection of renunciation. And so when we're discussing the verses in the Bhagavad Gita, it's very easy to forget the whole picture, you know, because we're focusing one verse per day. But the whole picture is, is that Arjuna's on the battlefield, confused about his duty, and, Arjuna, and Krishna is in, instructing him in the middle of the two armies. So this, uh, if you remember, the actual full title of the chapter is The Perfection of Renunciation. So this is very um, vital. Because at the beginning, uh, what we've understood by now is that Arjuna had an imperfect idea of renunciation. His idea of renunciation was to not fight, to leave the battlefield. And he justified it in so many ways. So this is very much like Brahma Satcham Jagat Mitya. You know, the Mayavadi idea, the misinterpretation of the Veda. Oh, this world is illusion. It's, and only Brahman is truth. And therefore, renounce this world. So, Buddhistic ideas, Mayavadi ideas, impersonalist ideas are based on this misunderstanding. Yes, we say, yes, it is mitya, it is illusory, but you cannot say it does not exist. Huh? But we say it is real, but it is moha, it is illusion, because it's temporary. Just like the chess game. It was temporary. It was all very serious when we were playing chess. I want to win, I want, don't want to lose. My wife is watching. <laughs> I'm very emotionally involved. But it's temporary. So this is the material world, Dukalayama Sashvitam. It is miserable and it is full of anxiety and it is temporary. Therefore it is mitya. But you cannot say it is not a real event. That is foolishness. If you have a bad tooth, you cannot just say, oh, it's an illusion. <laughs> it's, really a, it's really there. I have to really deal with it. I have to really do something. I have to go to the dentist, right? So, you, so just because something is illusory in the temporary sense, it doesn't mean to say you don't have to deal with it. So this exposes the fault of Mayavadi philosophy. It's not illusion. If you're having a cup of tea, you have a choice of two white powders, salt and sugar. Which one are you going to put in? Sugar, yes, of course, we don't drink tea, but but <laughs> you cannot say, oh, it's all illusory. The salt and the sugar, they're both white, they're both powders, and the difference is illusion. No, your tea is going to taste terrible, right? So it's real, but it's temporary. And it's unsatisfactory because it is a lesser energy than you. So... Arjuna's idea of, oh, I'll just give up, I'll renounce the battlefield, is based on this Buddhistic, voidistic, impersonalistic idea that it's all illusion. Now, that is not to say that a certain renunciation is not, uh, cannot be elevating. We saw in fourth chapter, Krishna gave a whole list of yagyas. He said, uh, there's the sacrifice of material possessions. Giving up. A, a man is a successful businessman. He's at the end of his life. He's got five, ten years left. He's thinking, I'll give in charity. I'll give back. So that's very good. That's elevating. That's because Krishna says later, Yogyadana Tapasa, uh, sacrifice, penance, and austerity should never be given up. So then, then there's other sacrifices. Uh, Krishna mentions you can do breathing exercises and that's also a sacrifice. Um, there's a sacrifice of knowledge. You can, uh, okay, now I've got time, I'm going to study the Vedas. 
So that's another sacrifice. And then Krishna, yajnam japa, japanam. That of yajnas I am japa, Krishna says. It's interesting. So certain renunciation is good. But the perfection of renunciation is the title of this chapter. And this is what Krishna has brought Arjuna to. That Arjuna, you must do your duty. Not because it's illusory, because you have your duty. But your duty should be performed as an offering to me. Yad karosi, yad nasi, yukshda dosi, dadasi, yad yad tapasya se, kunda, tat kurushwa, madapanam. Right? That everything should be performed as an offering for the Supreme. And we see that, right? Later we'll see. Manmana, okay, fix your consciousness on the spirit, on the transcendental platform. Madbhakto, how to do it as a devotee. Madhyaji. Do everything as an offering to the Supreme. Because later on in this chapter, Krishna says, you, no matter how much you renounce, you cannot renounce the need to feed yourself, to cover yourself with cloth in the cold, to sleep at night. Uh, Krishna says, you cannot maintain the material body without work. You have to feed it, keep it healthy, keep it clean, keep it safe. So, you cannot just say, oh, this I'm not the body, it's an illusion. <laughs> then you're in the category of madness, all right, insanity. You're not the body, it's an illusion, I don't have to feed it. Okay, go to see the doctor. <laughs> this is not practical philosophy. Just, you can renounce certain things, but Krishna says, don't renounce yagya dharma tapasya. And then he says, we'll, get, we'll read the verses now. He says, but prescribed duties, Arjuna, prescribed according to your position as a chatriya, in your case, should never be given up. Especially on the basis of the false word jugglery, that is all illusion and it doesn't count. So let's read these chapters, these verses. Because then we'll get the full picture, rather than... Like today we discussed about the five factors of action. <coughs> Arjuna said, O oh, mighty armed one, I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation, Chak. Chak and the of the renounced order of life, Sanyas, O oh, killer of the Keshi demon, master of the senses. So the Supreme Personality of God had said the giving up of activities that are based on material desire is what great learned men call the renounced order of life, sannyas. And giving up the results of all activities is what the wise call renunciation, chag. So there's chag, means to renounce attachment to the fruit of the activities. But before that, before you renounce the fruit, the action should be not spurred on by material desire. You see this? The giving up of activities based on material desire is what great learned men call the renounced order of life. So that means you should be spiritually motivated. That is the perfection of renunciation. Oh, I'm serving the qualified spiritual master. I'm serving the acharyas. I'm impelled by spiritual desire. I'm making a garland for the love of Krishna. That is spiritual desire. I'm cleaning the temple to please my guru. That is spiritual desire. And because I'm spiritually situated, I'm naturally in a chagi. That means I'm just performing activities. I'm making a garland for Krishna because I love Krishna. <laughs> I'm not thinking, oh, I'm making a garland and then Krishna will you know, make me the temple president <laughs> or something like that. So those type of, that is the material desire, right? We perform activities because we want the fruit. I work in the factory because I want the salary. I work in the office because I want the salary. So we look attached to the fruit. But the spiritual platform, everyone in the spiritual world is engaged uh, in ecstatic change, exchange of love. Everyone loves Krishna and Radharani and everybody else, and everybody lo is loved in return. 
That, and so that's real religion. Real religion is love. Love of Godhead. To love the Supreme Lord and all his expansions and to receive love in return. That is the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. That is love. And so in that state of consciousness there is no consideration of self, uh, fruit or attachment. Rather the other is there. The, oh, I want to give. Huh? So that is the Priyogyan Tattva. So this is uh, manifest here in this. You can see that in this. Some learned men declare that all kinds of fruitive activity should be given up as faulty. So it says all, Krishna said all kinds. We already discussed this. Just give up your uh, material duties, your fruitive activities, your karma. You just give it up as being faulty. Yet other sages maintain that acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be abandoned. So you, there's a discussion here. But some sages say you should never give up yogya dana tapasa. Krishna's posing a question. O oh, best of the Bharatas, now hear my judgment. After posing the question, Krishna says, hear my judgment about renunciation. So this is a big authority, right? This is the Supreme Lord. This is my judgment. He's, this is the Supreme Court. This is not the local court. This is the Supreme Court. But Krishna says it in that very charming way. Now hear my judgment, Krishna said. O tiger amongst men, renunciation is declared in the scriptures to be of three kinds. Acts of charity, uh, sorry, sacrifice, charity and penance are not to be given up. They must be performed. This is Krishna's judgment. Indeed, sacrifice, charity and penance purify even the great souls. Huh? Shankaracharya said three things a man should do every day. He should give in charity, even if it's a biscuit just to the dog. He should read Shastra at least one line and he should chant the holy name at least once. Yet Shankaracharya. They purify even great souls. And there's a story about Prabhupada. Prabhupada often gave away things. Um, there's a story about Prabhupada. I think he was in uh, Atlanta or America somewhere. Uh, and a devo This was in the early days. And uh, a devotee had um, received a winter pullover from his mother. So there was a darshan. The mother wasn't there. So the devotee said, my mother sent me this, but I want to give it to you, Prabhupada. Um, so Prabhupada took it. Oh, thank you. And he took off his own sweater, which he'd received earlier, which was a very costly one. Woolen one, some devotee had given it to him. He took it off and gave it to that devotee in return you see. So he, his mother had sent him a nice one perhaps but not as nice as the big fancy one and he just get spontaneously gave it. So oh, everyone was in ecstasy and that devotee was shocked to see, you know, what a real sadhu is. So this is the thing, purify even great souls. Number six, all these activities should be performed. Now this is the thing, perfection of renunciation, without attachment or any expectation of result. You see, that's this is the spiritual platform. We already mentioned this. In the spiritual platform, there's no seeking of a result. Everyone is admiram. Everyone is in ecstatic love of Godhead. What you need when you have that, right? But this is for the sadhakas. Understand the preogen, the goal, and maintain this in your mind. Just perform activities, but don't be thinking what I'll get in return, because that will not, that is not part of spiritual consciousness. So it's there naturally because we're coming from conditioned level, but we should be careful about it. Should be, ah, look, they should be performed as a matter of duty. O son of Pritha, 
right? What did Maharaj Parikshit ask when he was uh, cursed to die in seven days? He saw Sukadev Goswami and he says, what is the duty of a person at the time of death? I'm going to die. So this is the human condition. He was a great king. He was ruling the kingdom for the benefit of the people. So now I'm going to die. He didn't think, oh, now I can have seven days of enjoyment. <laughs> Sometimes, no, his question was, no, I've performed duty my whole life as a king, as the emperor. Now what's my duty now that I'm going to die? You know what He didn't think, now I'm going to curse that boy, I'm going to get revenge. No, what's my duty? So this, you see, Krishna says, they should be performed as a matter of duty, O Sanapritha. That is my final opinion. So that's the Supreme Court. He's making it sure. Now hear my judgment. And then he said, this is my final. You have to perform your duties, but without attachment to the fruit and in a mood of duty. Uh, and that's yagi. Manmana bhavamad bhakto madhyaji. Madhyaji means yagya. So you perform your activities as a yagya. I'm getting up in the morning, I have to take a bath before Mangalati. This, it's uncomfortable in the winter season, you might think, but it's my yagya. Huh? I'm avoiding uh, materialistic association, mate asat sanghi chagi, I'm not eating bad foods. I'm avoiding this, I'm following the order of spiritual master, but I'm doing it, it's my duty, it's my offering. So this way, every activity becomes transcendentalized. All the duties that we have to perform in life, they're an offering. Mam Namaskaru, fourth one, is we offer it with humility. <coughs> so this is Krishna's final opinion. You can't give up your duty, Arjuna, because my final opinion is that you have a duty to your brother. So this is a material judgment, is it not? Oh, you have material duty, he's a king. Duryodhan is not qualified, he's very demoniac. He's tried to kill you and your brothers, your whole childhood, you, the poison cake, the house of lack. In every way, uh, he has uh, attacked you and your brothers. So now, are you going to leave the battlefield? What's your duty? You're a Kshatriya. You don't have duty to Yudhisthira. So this is material logic and it's very valid. But ultimately, we say that ultimately, as it said earlier, Prabhupada said, ultimately, the real motivation is spiritual. That Krishna wants me to fight this battle. Huh? There may be so many material argumentations. You have your duty. You must perform your duty. But the real motivation is not material duty. The real motivation is this is what Krishna wants. But that may not be immediately available to the sadhakas. You understand? That's hard to... Oh, oh Krishna wants me to, uh, you know, live in Radha Kund. <laughs> or something, making up what is Krishna's real desire for you, you have to come to the platform where you can properly perceive that. Until then, perform your duties as an offering. And when you have realization of Krishna consciousness, when you're directly communing with Krishna, then you can act as Jaiva Dharma in your real relationship. But don't try to artificially act that way. That is the Sahajiya contamination. That I'm not going to follow rules and regulations, I'm just going to concoct my own dev devotional service. No, you have to enter the spiritual world in reality, not in imagination. So, here Krishna is emphasizing to Arjuna, you have your duties, you perform it. Later on he's going to give the ultimate perfection, Savadharma Prajadya, your duties give them up, Mame Kam Sharanam Vraja, you surrender to me, Antvam Savapapebhyo Muksha Yishami Masuchaha. 
So Arjuna can understand that. And now we can understand that level of renunciation because Krishna has led us through all the different levels. So, yes. That was number six, right? My final opinion. Prescribed duty should, now Krishna is going to re-emphasize the point, should never be renounced. If one gives up his prescribed duty because of illusion, such renunciation is said to be in the mode of ignorance. That's Arjuna at the beginning. Oh, this is terrible. There'll be a big battle and people will die. This is illusion. Krishna said, no, nobody's going to die. The soul's eternal. Your, you, all your arguments, they sound very compassionate and well-meaning, but they're all nonsense. So this is illusion. Then the next thing, after anyone who gives up prescribed duties, your dharma, out of fear of bodily discomfort is said to have renounced in the mode of passion. Such action never leads to the elevation of renunciation. So that was also in Arjuna. He didn't want to kill. He didn't want the... So mentally he said it's all illusory. And then he didn't want to fight. He, he said, I, won't want, I don't want to fight with Bhishma and all these great souls. Uh, it's discomfort, yes. But what's the primary cause? The primary thing Krishna's already said, Arjuna, you have your duty and you must perform it. That that's the final opinion. Number nine, when one performs his prescribed duty only because it ought to be done and renounces all material association and all attachment to the fruit, his renunciation is said to be in the mode of goodness. So that's clear, right? Because Arjuna was thinking, if I perform this battle, the women will be unprotected, there will be Varna Shankara, the society will collapse. You know, he was talking about the fruit. Arjuna, Krishna is telling him, here, don't worry about the fruit, Arjuna. You must do your duty. That's the final opinion. So then, number ten. The intelligent renouncer situated in the mode of goodness, neither hateful of inauspicious work nor attached to auspicious work, has no doubts about work. So Krishna says here, right, the intelligent renouncer. That means somebody who has spiritual knowledge, who sees the spiritual platform. Intelligence, real intelligence is to distinguish between matter and spirit. That is intelligence to see the difference between spirit and matter, to see that the body uh, alone is not intelligent, but to see the body and understand there's a spirit soul within the body, that is intelligence. So spiritual knowledge gives intelligence. Intelligence to understand there's five factors of action, that it, the super soul is the ultimate. This is intelligence, it's based on spiritual knowledge. but the material world, they're mudha. They think, I'm the body and that's it. So, intelligent renouncer means somebody in the mode of goodness whose, whose understanding is spiritual. Yes, I'm renouncing, I'm offering it to Krishna. So, number 11. It is indeed impossible, oh, this is what we mentioned before, indeed impossible for an embodied being to give up all activities. See, Krishna says, embodied being. You have to keep yourself clean. You have to keep you well fed. You have to drink water in the hot season. You have to do so many things. You can't just give up activities. Even if you're an avaduta, <laughs> you've got to drink some water sometimes. But of course, that's a different story. But to maintain the material body, but it's, in, it's actually, in, in, also that's in the Bhagavatam actually, that's also in Nectar of Devotion. This is a very interesting point. Krishna, it's, sometimes, it's stated in the Shastra that sometimes a spiritually engrossed person is on such a high level of ecstasy that he's unaware of the material platform. He's unaware that I'm thirsty, that I'm hungry, that I'm naked in the street. This is, it's so entranced on the spiritual platform, he's so involved in the leela of, that he's, 
he forgets that he has a material body still. So it is stated in the Shastra, in such a condition the Supreme Lord takes personal care of that spirit soul's body. He supervises that body, makes sure that it is maintained. This is statement in the Shastra. I think it's nectar of instruction. But it's throughout the Veda, especially uh, Dhruva Maharaj, you can look it up. Dhruva Maharaj, um, after you know he became elevated, he took a tour. It's in the Bhagavatam, fourth canto. He took a tour about the universe and he wanted to see the great saintly people. So he was visiting the Avadutas and the great sages and this is mentioned in the purpose there. That the Supreme Lord is, is there in the Gita also, Name Bhakti Pranashati, but also one who is devoted to me. I carry, I preserve what he has and I carry what he lacks. That's that sloka. Huh? Yogeshamiha. So Krishna looks personally after the devotee who's on that. But if we we shouldn't think, okay, Krishna will look after us. When when we you know, we should act in accordance with our particular qualification, that's sanity. Alright? Yes. It's impossible to give up work if you're embodied. But he who renounces the fruits of action is one who is truly renounced. Krishna is saying it again. Repetition is necessary for understanding. One who has renounced the fruits, or he is chagi, he is truly renounced. And then number 12, for one who is not renounced, the threefold fruits of action, desirable, undesirable, makes a crew after death. Loko yam kam abandon. If you're not renounced, if you're greedy for the result, you're going to come under the laws of karma because of your motivation. But those who are in the renounced order of life have no such result to suffer or enjoy. So Krishna is quickly putting that to Arjuna. If now, if you act up properly, Arjuna, you don't have to worry about causing mayhem in society by killing all these people. You don't have to worry about some bad result that will arrive on your doorstep. Huh? You have no result to suffer in joy if you perform your activities as a duty. O oh, mighty armed Arjuna, uh, Mahabaho, is telling Arjuna, hey, you're a big man, Arjuna. You're a mighty armed. Get back into your mode. Stop being, oh, I can't fight Krishna. Oh, mighty armed, according to the Vedanta, there are five causes for the accomplishment of all action. Now learn of these from me. So now he's given him the good talk and now he says, Arjuna, we've given you the big talk, now it's time for action. <laughs> right? So that comes to today's verse. We'll finish at this point. Any question? Action speaks louder than words, Arjuna. I'm well, I see many people in renounced odor in this age of Kali that they're not really renounced. They have millions of dollars in their bank account. I, I, I mean, I try to rent a house over here that belongs to the city. I see. Uh, you know, I'm just like, what's going on here? The picture is so topsy turvy now in Kali Yuga, correct? Well, I always remember. I always remember one thing Prabhupada said, that we're all in an aeroplane and we should fly our aeroplane back to Godhead. Our own pilot. Or yeah, we're our own pilot. Nobody else. We should. So there are always going to be anomalies. Uh, Sanatan Goswami, he had a fancy blanket, right? And he, Lord Chita, he met Lord Chaitanya after he escaped from the Chandkazi. Mm -hmm. And he had a blanket, a very expensive blanket. Lord Chaitanya looked at it disapprovingly. Sanatan went and changed it for a, qui uh, a quilt at the bathing ghat. Uh, so, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya 
after he became enlightened, he wrote a hundred slokas. One of them is Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. Lord Chaitanya, you have come to give bhakti that's characterized by vidya, spiritual knowledge, realization, and uh, vairag, non-attachment, vairag, we talk about vairag, non-attachment to the fruit of actions. So, that should be practiced in an exemplary manner by the leaders of society. And sannyasis are the leaders of a spiritual society. So, Vedic tradition, we see that the great sannyasis, the great leaders of society, they practice Vairagya Vidya. Uh, they don't unnecessarily accumulate wealth. At the beginning of the Bhagavatam, we ex it's explained there, the Kali resides in five places. Number, number five is where gold or wealth is accumulated. Uh, so it's very dangerous to accumulate wealth in Kali Yuga. Kali can act through that wealth. So there's no doubt that sannyasis and they gain admiration from society by overt signs of renunciation, physically and mentally. But also, Srila, you see, this is the traditional role of a sannyasi. But in Iskon, Prabhupada once said, they, they, he showed him a picture of a sannyasi, and the sannyasi was going like this because the people were trying to give him money. And he was saying, no, I don't want. So Prabhupada said, you can take a picture of me and I'll catch all the money because I know how to use it. I want to use book. I want to print books. I want to open temples. I want to open prashad distribution programs. I want to speak with the leaders of society how the wealth of a society can be properly used. And we know from, you know, intimate association with Prabhupada that everything he used uh, was in the service of, and through, he, there's no black mark, no black record on Prabhupada. I mean, it's even incredible just to even say that. But everything Prabhupada did was like a lotus above the muddy pond of the material world because that's his sublime position. So he did things that a sannyasi shouldn't normally do. He married disciples, he garried grihastas, he performed yajyas, he, got, he took a lot of wealth, he took a lot of management. But if we take sannyas and we try to emulate Prabhupada in that way, that is dangerous. If we take sannyas, we should emulate the sannyas of Lord Chaitanya, of Sanatan Goswami, of Rupa Goswami. That kind of sannyas uh, we should also bear in mind. Prabhupada had to do many extraordinary things because he was starting a Krishna conscious Vedic society from scratch. But w if we as neophytes take sannyas and then we collect big money, we have many female disciples and we live in luxury, we be then we're being seduced by maya. But the ultimate principle is to fly your own aeroplane. You understand? If everyone wants to go drinking, you stay and, uh, and drink water. You understand? If everyone wants to jump off the cliff, seduced by Maya, don't you jump off the cliff. Dadami buddhi yogam tam, use your intelligence. And that means read the Chaitanya Charitamrita. There you have how devotees act. There you have how devotees live a disciplined life. Particularly the leaders of society, the gurus, the shas, they should be renounced. 
and they should be above suspicion as Prabhupada says a, a black spot on a deity everyone sees one black spot so the disciplines of sannyas life they have to be followed and we can't just say oh it's yukta vairag I can do anything if we're in a neophyte condition that would be my answer to your question but the ultimate point, the thing is, don't find fault with others. You know, just fly your own airplane. You chant 16 rounds. You f three Gayatris. You follow regulative principles. You study the Shastra. You teach the Shastra. Right? And if everyone, if some people want to have big salary, big house, big apartment, uh, invest in the stock market then you know leave them to the super soul <laughs> that would be my advice but if you if you see in the material if you if you spend your time finding fault you're going to have no time for anything else <laughs> because this is the material world you see my point but at the same time out of a sense of duty you're saying we should have a society that um that there are high standards for the leaders. They have to be exemplary. Because, what is that verse? Whatever the great man does, common man. So, the great men, or let's say the people who are institu institutionally appointed, they have a duty to um, follow the pertinent instructions for their ashram. Because also another thing about Prabhupada, Prabhupada didn't live in great opulence. One of Prabhupada's instructions was that he wanted the temples to be in debt so that the devotees had to work hard. <laughs> you know, you okay, open a temple. But Prabhupada, we don't have the money. Open it and then sell books. <laughs> And then go and, you know, perform devotional activities. You understand? The problem with wealth is you become comfortable. Oh, this chair, it's okay, but it's plastic. <laughs> <laughs> I've got enough money for a handmade French design with a nice cushion. Do it for me. <laughs> so money is very dangerous that's right at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita but fly your own airplane back to Godhead what does Krishna says uh, Every, I, everything comes from me those that realize this what do they do they they bhajatam pritipo iti matva bhajanti mam perform bhajan and then I will give you intelligence how to come to me tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam pritipo arvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upyanti te right so they are the principles of spiritual life but if people want, don't want to follow and they're becoming seduced by Maya, then we shouldn't condemn them because they're just seduced by Maya. Because after all, every spirit soul remains pure. It's just the consciousness that is polluted. Think about that. We can't affect the sun, but we can affect the consciousness of the sun in the form of sunlight. So every single spirit soul, Maya does not enter the soul, but it clouds the consciousness. So if we understand in that way, then the propensity for compassion comes forward. The danger of fault finding is that we become envious. I'm not saying this is in your case, but if we always maintain the idea that everyone is a pure spirit soul, who is uh, clouded, the consciousness is clouded, then we have a correct vision. Then we have sadhu vision, 
because we can be compassionate. That, and that's how Prabhupada treated us, right? Prabhupada didn't see, oh, this is this person, this is person. No, Prabhupada saw the soul. And he gave us the means to awaken the soul. There's a story, Nanda Kumar, I think he was, his servant in the old days. I heard this story years ago. One day he said he was Prabhupada's personal servant and one day he just disappeared. He came back six months later and he said, Oh Prabhupada, I'm so sorry. Um, my senses pulled me away and I fell into Maya. Prabhupada said, You make nice rasgulas. Go to the kitchen and make me some rasgula. That was it. <laughs> There was no big inquisition, or you, you didn't do, you, Prabhupada just said, I remember, you used to make nice rasgula. I'd like some of your rasgulas. There was no big inquisition, there was no chastity. Prabhupada, sadhu, just re-engaged. So, because Prabhupada was such a sadhu, as well as a sage, that's how it's gone grew because everyone knew Prabhupada was the sadhu and he had compassion because Krishna has many qualities but the sadhu is a particularly he is a manifestation of Krishna's quality of compassion huh? oh hey Vaishnava Takura Doyara Sangara hey das. Huh? Ocean of mercy. Huh? So we have to cultivate that vision. I'm not saying you like it or it's, uh, I'm putting you on the spot. Fly your own plane. Like yeah, we have to, Prabhupada said that, you have to fly your own aeroplane. Now, if some people, you can radio instructions to somebody in another aeroplane, but their hands are in the control. And if they want to go into the valley, if they want to crash into the mountain, that's their temporary adjustment. We want to fly back to Godhead. Right? So we'll finish at this point. You're looking at the clock. You're hungry. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Bhagavad Gita Ki.